Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're so glad to welcome you as part of our community tonight. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and distributed live stream. By entering this virtual meeting room, you give your consent to be recorded and distributed by Vienna Live with Simeon Morrow and other third parties. If you prefer to not be recorded, please go to the Facebook Live video feed, the link to which I have now placed in the chat room. Tonight, our featured guest is Ron Rosenstock, a fine arts photographer and author. Ron, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Simeon. Pleasure to be here. And I'm, I'm just amazed looking at all, all my old friends and I'm seeing on my, my screen here, you know, about this big. Hi, everyone. Good hi. to see you all. Hi, hi, hi. hi, hi. Wow. I wish you all could be in my studio with me. I would prefer that, but uh, second best, here we are. And uh, so uh, just also to all of the particip today's participants, if you have a question, please just write something in the chat box and then uh, I will address you and then we, you can speak directly with Ron. Thank you. So Ron, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into fine arts photography. It started when I was very young, Simeon. Um, I, I've always had like this fascination, fascination with nature. Actually, I, I have a memory of being in a, in a stroller. I couldn't have been more than three or four months old. So staring up at the clouds and, you know, not being judgmental at all, not saying, wow, that's amazing. Just kind of feeling, wow, that it's like, like the sense of belonging somehow. And that, that really developed uh, as, as the years went by when I would, be in a forest or any place with the nature and feel like so connected you know it, it's like you know what, what, what's out there kind of mirrored something deep inside of me and I, I think we you know all of us are the same that way you know if we could just kind of walk through nature and be present to the moment we all kind of get that feeling of belonging and um you know, like like a, a part of us is is that you know it, it, we're all one thing together, and um, I wanted to uh, I'm going to start off with a, a PowerPoint program uh, that that kind of shows you the kind of work that I do, uh, a lot of my interests, and uh, I'll be talking a little bit about uh, photographic technique as well. You know, you know, Minor White used to kind of say like it's sort of fifty fifty. You know, you're the, you're the technician and you're the creative. I, uh, at the same time, you have to have the technique. My technique, like everybody else's, has developed over many, many years, you know, since you started in photography. You know, I started with an 8x10 view camera. Most people start off small. I started big and worked my way small, you know, and now uh, for the last 25 years, I've been, um, you know, a, a, a dedicated uh, digital photographer. And uh, just recently, uh, like within the last two days, believe it or not, I just kind of uh, decided to go mirrorless, you know, just for the weight. Somehow, as I got older, my cameras got heavier. I don't know how that happened, uh, but I was aware of that with the 8x10 view camera. I couldn't lug it up mountains anymore, and I went to a 4x5 view camera. Then, uh, then thank goodness, digital came out about 25, 30 years ago, and I went to digital cameras, but they were pretty heavy. And now I just went to a Canon, uh, it's called R8, full frame sensor, and I ha haven't even used it yet. So <laughs> anyhow, technique changes. I'm going to uh, start the PowerPoint program that I call a celebration of light. And uh, I'm going to show you some early work, middle work, late work, whatever. You know, my vision has been very consistent from the beginning, I started, uh, you know, I worked with Minor White uh, in uh, 71, you know, at MIT. And, um, you know, it started teaching uh, actually just a few years later, and I've been teaching ever since. 
and I, you know, um, I, I, I'm kind of half a teacher and half a photographer. You know, I enjoy both very much. And, um, you know, in terms of technique, like this started off as just a regular color photograph. And, you know, with this basic software, I converted it to black and white and kind of gave a little bit more definition in the clouds and burned the corners a little bit, pretty much the way I, I would have done it in the dark room. You know, um, I don't, uh, well, I, I mean, uh, the true, true confession here, I don't have Photoshop. I don't even have Lightroom. I have the very, very basic of, of, of software because I feel I could do everything that I want to do. Um, I could do more than Ansel Adams was able to do in the dark room. Who could ask for anything more? You know, I'm not making photo collage. I'm trying to be as true to my subject matter as possible. So we're just gonna go through a number of images. Now, this one was an older one, and it's one of those wonderful, happy accidents. Um, if there is such a thing as an accident, this was done with my eight by 10 view camera in Ireland. And to get everything in focus from near to far, I had to have a fairly small aperture and the wind was blowing like crazy on the, the branches of this, uh, it's sort of a, um, well, the Irish call it firs and the English call it gorse. And um, the sun was right on the branches and the, the fastest exposure I could get at the time was about a quarter of a second. I was waiting for the wind to stop. You know, it kind of takes a breath every now and then. And um, I thought it had stopped. I made the exposure and the puff of wind moved the branches a little bit during my exposure. And it kind of gave this unexpected glow. Uh, you know, so I've been, again, things just kind of happen. Uh, Ansel Adams once said that happy accidents happen to people who are out there the most. You know, I mean, if you're out there working, um, there's... Um, a trend to all my photographs, and that is I photograph light. I don't photograph subject matter. In reality, nobody photographs actual subject matter. We only photograph the light reflecting off the subject matter. That's what we see. That's what we're attracted to. You know, that's that's part of the mystery because it's changing all the time. It's never the same. This was in Iceland. And we were just driving by with uh, this uh, flat area, and the you know the tide had gone out, and it was late in the evening, and there was just this incredible glow on all these little rivulets, you know, and that's sort of what what draws me. Now, um, I'm not too proud to tell you, I occasionally take a photograph out the bus window, and this is one of them. <laughs> you know, sometimes we can't stop, and uh, I see something, and I say, oh my gosh, this is amazing. You know, so instead of telling the driver, stop, you know, often that would be very dangerous, you know, wherever we are. So I kind of leaned out the window and just made this exposure. You know, I saw the, the sun just coming behind this cloud and it's just streaming out, just beautiful light. Um, I also do color work. Uh, since I started doing digital, I do almost half and half. I mean, if something is colorful, I photograph it, photograph it in color. You know, I still think of myself as a black and white photographer, although I just had a fairly major exhibition at the Fitchburg Art Museum, um, you know, in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, called Ron Rosenstock's World of Color, um, which was a surprise to me, uh, but <laughs> Uh, it was it was pretty amazing experience. Um, you know, I could say things with color that I just can't say any other way. You know, there are just certain things that that would be different, not not better or worse, but just kind of different. Like obviously, this in black and white would would not work at all. You know, it's really all about the color, and that's that's what I see. I see reflected light. Um, and I, you know, I, I work with the balance of the image with the light that's reflecting off the subject matter always as something as simple as this. This is a, a rooftop in Fez in, in Morocco. And um, it's, it's part of a rug shop down below. And I was just sort of wandering around and uh, came to this very quiet sort of almost like a place of meditation and this streak of light coming through just really, really powerful. Now, this I find very interesting. Um, this was the very, very first digital photograph I ever made in my life. 
I never, I had no plan on going uh, to digital. Um, in fact, um, I would still do my international photo tours, taking a large format camera with me. And this was the first time I went to the Czech Republic and uh, we start off in Vienna and uh, I pass and, and half the group had digital cameras to my surprise. And I was thinking to myself, you know, I better learn about digital photography because I would really be bad at packing bags at the supermarket, you know, so I didn't have much of a choice here. I passed the camera shop and I saw this tiny little Casio camera. I mean, it was like the size of a pack of cigarettes, only thinner. You know, and it was for something like two or three hundred dollars, and it was probably two or three megapixels. Also, I bought this tiny little camera, and you know, made a few exposures. Mostly, I worked with my four by five, but uh, this was one of the exposures I knew so little that I didn't know how to get rid of the date stamp. Remember the early digital cameras? They had a little date stamp on it, and I had no idea. I didn't know about cloning. You know, like Sergeant Schultz, I know nothing. And uh, it took me it took me some time to catch on. Um, I worked with a professional printer for many years and learned a lot about printing that way. I learned about cloning and I learned but what I wanted to learn was how to make a print the same way I would make it in the dark room. You know, and I taught darkroom photography uh, at Clark University from like 1970 to 2000, like 30 years teaching the zone system, uh, film, et cetera. And I had retired from Clark in uh, 1970, and I've been leading you know, international photo tours ever since. Speaking about color, again, this wouldn't really work very well as a black and white image. This, this is a, 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 a Skogafoss in, uh, um, in Ireland, and uh, just this amazing uh, kind of waterfall. And we generally get there at four in the afternoon, just as the sun is kind of coming straight at it and, and making this, this incredible double rainbow. Again, about color. This would be okay in black and white, but the, the glow of the candle and, and the warmth and his expression, you know, it becomes like, a, like a, a, a total kind of feeling about it that wouldn't really work in black and white. Um, you know, I've been leading photo tours for so many years. I don't always go back every year to the same country, but I've, I've gone to Bhutan, I think three times so far. Um, it's a difficult trip. Uh, well, I should say difficult to get there, you know, from Boston to, uh, to Narita Airport in Tokyo, and then from Tokyo to Bangkok, and then Bangkok to Paro. It is a long flight. But, you know, my theory about flying is anything over like four or five hours I call boring. And boring is boring. Like it doesn't go beyond boring, right? I mean, that's kind of an infinite statement right there. Once you land, you forget all about it. So, um, but Bhutan was amazing, you know, getting getting to meet the monks, uh, uh, going to a, a sort of a sacred, uh, you know, evening service, a candlelight service in one of the monasteries. So I've been exposed to just wonderful experiences. In my Italy trip, we always get up early in the morning, um, generally before 95% of the tourists. So this is from the Santa Trinita Bridge in uh, Florence, looking back at the Ponte Vecchio. Uh, obviously digital, all my color work, obviously is uh, in digital, digital photography. And, um, you know, on all my trips, which I'll talk about, you know, uh, teaching for people who, who have the questions. And, um, you know, it's really for, for people of all levels of accomplishment. You know, uh, we all go and photograph and I help everybody, you know, to make more meaningful images. One of my favorite destinations, of course, they're all my favorite destinations, but Greenland. And uh, I have to tell you quickly, Greenland is going to be uh, on everybody's radar screen soon because they have just almost completed like three major airports in, in uh, on the west coast of Greenland. And I always fly into Nuuk, which is uh, the capital of Greenland. And, um, you know, it's, I'm, I'm afraid it's going to become too touristy in years to come. And I, I still go on my next trip as next a year. Is this coming September? So 11 months from now, uh, back to Greenland. And we get the, this Aurora Borealis like 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. And I go in September. And in September, the temperature in Nuuk is like, I would say, 
average temperature is 45 to 50. Like it's not, if you think of Greenland, everyone thinks it's just all ice. Well, not the case at all. Um, I mean, it's just off the coast of Labrador, you know, uh, it's closer to uh, to Canada than, than it is to, to Europe, that's for sure. Um, but we'll be able to fly pretty soon directly from Boston or New York, right, right to Nuke. It'll probably be like a, I don't know, a four hour flight, I'm guessing. It won't be, it won't be that long at all. So Greenland is just amazing. We go up these fjords and every year I go, you know, there, there are different icebergs that have broken off from uh, the moraine of uh, one of the main glaciers. And this is like looking right into the sun later in the afternoon using a small aperture to get a little bit of a starburst and, you know, just sort of working with the, with the image. But ice is just so amazing. Icebergs, you know, the idea of these huge chunks of ice breaking off and slowly melting and just becoming part of, of the ocean. It's, it's unbelievable. And every year, you know, there's just more and more melting. Um, I, I, you know, don't have to give you a, a lecture about climate change, but, you know, because I travel a lot to Iceland and Greenland, I really am so aware of it. Um, as we are now, actually, in America, with this particular summer, the heat wave and all that. Well, I won't go into climate change. We know it's there. Another one of my favorite trips, again, they're all my favorite trips, but Scotland. In fact, I'm going, um, I, my Scotland trip is coming up this uh, about a month. Well, September 15th, I think I'm flying over to Glasgow. And uh, Scotland is also, it's a beautiful, beautiful country, wonderful people. This photograph was taken in um, what, what's now kind of a museum. It's an old crofter's house called the Black House, where they used to have a turf fire going on the floor of the house. There was no chimney, and that was to keep keep people warm. But it was filled up with turf smoke, you know. Um, and here by the window, you kind of see uh, the, the smoke is sort of illuminated by the, the window light. This is one of my early photographs. Uh, 1983, 84, and again, it was under the eight by 10 view camera. And this was chosen to be made into a banner about 30 feet by 40 feet that covered the, the whole front of the Worcester Art Museum in uh, 2011, when I had a major exhibition in, in Worcester. And uh, someone, um, and I, I, I met the person who, who actually purchased that banner and put it on the side of her barn here in Worcester, Massachusetts. And people pass and they see this forest. This is in the west of Ireland. And um, I was made an honorary citizen, in fact, of the town of Westport in County Mayo, Ireland, in about 1986 or 87. So I started bringing people there um, in the 1970s. And uh, I, uh, I owned a house there for 40 years, in fact and uh, sold it about 10 years ago. I still go over once or twice a year and we stay in a four-star hotel. My trips have evolved as everything has evolved. In the early years, I was the driver, I was the guide, I, uh, I was the chief cook. Uh, we now uh, moved uh, up, 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 up. We work with a, 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 you know, a travel uh, agency over there, transportation company, I mean, they have a Mercedes Sprinter a professional driver. I could just sit there and talk on the microphone and we stay in four-star hotels and have gourmet food and and uh, the life of Riley, what can I say? So um, this is uh, one of the highlights of the trip in Scotland, the um, Stones of Callanish. You know, and we, we get there early in the morning and late in the afternoon, you know, to photograph. And it's just really a magical, magical place. Going back to Ireland, and again, it's all about the light, seeing this wonderful light streaming over the clouds. This is at Murrisk Abbey, right at the foot of Croix Patrick, the holy mountain in Ireland. And I was walking back to the bus. I already packed up my tripod, and I'm, I was a little late, so I'm walking fast. And all of a sudden, you know, it doesn't last long, the light. You just got to be there. So I quickly grabbed my camera and handheld and made this, this exposure, you know, and worked with it. These wonderful old abbeys with this glow uh, in Ireland, um, you know, it just, and there's, there's so many of these abbeys around. This is called Ross Abbey in Hedford, and also in County Mayo. Just, um, you know, you, you almost feel like Cromwell just left, you know, and he was there in the 1600s. And uh, you really, and it just, these are just open to the public. Is They're never crowded, these old abbeys. 
you know, they're basically in ruins, but the, the government keeps them from getting any worse, you know, uh, but it's, uh, you, you still kind of feel the spirit of what was there hundreds of years ago. This is a more abstract uh, light coming through these uh, kind of a, a dwelling made of like bamboo in uh, in Morocco, in the Sahara. Uh, the next one is the same idea, same concept. This is in Santorini in Greece. Again, light coming through the, you know, the roof, just creating wonderful shadows. I mean, it really is an example of photographing the light. It's not about the subject matter. It's always about the light. Um, this is in Chef Shoen, which is the northern part of Morocco. And I was just, you know, walking with my group and I saw the sun coming through this alleyway and I quickly got my camera. I saw this incredible shadow, this, this arrow kind of pointing uh, the way. And people said, what are you photographing? Um, and I tried to explain it's about the light. You know, it's very hard to kind of switch your thinking. We're so accustomed to identifying with subject matter. The idea in photography is not to identify, not to judge, to accept, to be present to the moment, to experience, you know, the light. And if you're always thinking of something else or, you know, uh, seeing, um, you know, it reminds me uh, quickly, uh, there's a book called Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. I think Edna Fairburn or uh, Fairbanks, can't remember which one. But uh, there was an exercise of drawing a, a chair upside down and right side up. I couldn't do it right side up because I was thinking chairness upside down. I could just see the angles of, of the struts and where the wood fit in. And I drew a perfect chair upside down. And that's how your thinking has to be. And now I'm very fortunate that I started off shooting upside down. My eight by 10 view camera and the four by five, the image was always upside down on the ground glass, which kind of helps a lot with composing the image. And I kind of still kind of have a large format mentality. And maybe that's what helps me kind of really be more present to the moment and just see the light and paths of light. Uh, you know, I, I notice this wherever I go. This is uh, one of the dunes in the Sahara Desert. And the, my Morocco trip is really miraculous. Um, some of you out there I know have been with me. And uh, it's just uh, an incredible experience, uh, the Sahara Desert. I tell people it's like an ocean in slow motion. You know, and with the sun shining, we go out early in the morning on the dunes and we get these deep shadows. Here's a, another it's a path of light um, in uh, Miyajima Island in Japan. I've, I've done Japan a couple of times. Uh, again, it's, it's about, a, I think it's a 12 or 13 hour flight from Boston. But Japan is just the most amazing country with these monasteries all over the place and Tory gates. I really love Japan. Um, again, photographing light. You know, just kind of seeing light and shadow. Here we are in the northern coast of, uh, or the eastern fjords, sorry, uh, of uh, of uh, Iceland, a town called H O P F N, which is pronounced Hop, not Hafen, which I thought it was for many years. Just Hop. Again, light. Vinyl Haven. I just came back from Vinyl Haven, Maine, um, Sunday afternoon. I was up there for two weeks. Uh, family vacation, but I always do a workshop there in June, and I take people up, uh, especially from this, from where I live. Uh, I live in Holden, Mass., so uh, people who live in this area can leave their car at my studio, and I drive up, uh, I drive them there and back, and uh, Vinyl Haven is just a, a beautiful remote island. It's 15 miles off the coast of Rockland, Maine, and, um, you know, we stay there and do a workshop. Oh, another one of my great places. I know I'm packing a lot in here and I got to wind this up pretty soon, but the Faroe Islands, a lot of people don't even know where the Faroe Islands are or what's there. It is amazing. You know, it's a Danish protectorate. Um, it's kind of, it's about an hour's flight from Bergen, Nor well, not even that long, 45 minutes maybe from Bergen, Norway, um, or from, uh, from Iceland, you could go east another 45 minutes, kind of in the middle there. Uh, just beautiful, beautiful island. We have great accommodations there. And uh, it's uh, just a wonderful experience. The Faroe Islands, I'll be going there next next year sometime. I have to look at my schedule. Can't remember. Um, just going up the fjords uh, in uh, you know, the, the west coast of, uh, of Greenland, you know, the mountains. I mean, when I see these mountains, I say Ansel Adams would be happy here. You know, there's just so much to photograph. And this is all from a boat, handheld 
we have a really comfortable boat, you know, in Greenland when we tour up the fjords to go to the, the glaciers. This is with a wide angle, you know, from our boat. Moving right along here, a little bit more from Vinyl Haven, Maine, an area called the Basin. And, you know, every time I go there, it's different. You know, the tide is at a different level. There's different amounts of clouds, different amount of seaweed, different amount of foliage. You know, I go back to the same places all the time, and they're never the same. You know, it's always really wonderful. Um, you know, just seeing the light as it is. You know, I was on the Academia Bridge in Venice on a really foggy morning, you know, and I'm looking at the uh, Maria della Salute Church kind of saying this would be really good with something dark in the foreground and ba bum out of the blue there's this gondolier comes you know uh by himself on, on a sole gondola on, on the main uh canal you know just in the right place at the right time for me to make that image same thing happened here the Olson farm in Cushing Maine you know where Andrew Wyeth did uh, Christina's world Re uh you know it's called Christina's world I call this Christina's world revisited and uh, this horse uh, just came out of nowhere uh, at the right time while I was making the exposure on a very foggy morning. Um, almost to the end here, folks. Uh, one of my last shots from a, a place I call the Sunset Spot uh, in the west of Ireland. We always go there overlooking Clue Bay, you know, at sunset. And um, actually, it's called Ross Barna. Ross in Irish means like a peninsula. So this is like a, on a peninsula. I'm going to end with just a few very recent images that I made a, a couple of months ago in New Zealand, another incredibly gorgeous country. We did a helicopter ride to the top of Fox Glacier, and I swear it, it felt like being on Mount Everest. It was truly, I mean, a deeply kind of spiritual experience, you know, being up there on a snowpack on the top of this glacier and, uh, you know, the sun behind the clouds. You know, I made this particular exposure. And then at Milford Sound, looking at the sunset at Mount Cook, you know, just kind of hitting the, the tops uh, of, of the mountain. Just really a moving experience. And I'm going to end with also Mount Cook and the moonrise uh, over Mount Cook uh, and, uh, in New Zealand. Just a, a fabulous experience. Well, I'm going to stop my sharing because that is the end of my slideshow. So, Simeon, whew, right on time, huh? Fantastic. Back to you. So, yes, I would like to um, just uh, end the broadcast and then open it up to everyone who'd like to stay on Zoom for questions. Uh, so, I'd like to ask you, Ron, with all of the, the technological upheaval over the past 80 years, what do you see in the future of photography? That's like the future of the world, Simeon. Uh, I'm... <laughs> I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't have that ability to kind of know, but I know the only thing we can depend on is change. I mean, look what's happened in, in the digital world, you know, um, with cameras starting off with two and three megapixels and now 25, 30, 40, I mean, a medium format, you can go up to something like 80 megapixels, uh, you know, the miniaturization of everything. And now, you know, this new frontier of artificial intelligence, nobody knows the extent of that. Uh, we don't have a handle on it yet. When things first open up, it's like it goes in a zillion directions until the dust settles. But I'm sure that's going to play a role in all of our lives, you know, one way or another. Um, you know, there was one more... I got nervous about the time, but it was actually a, a, one more slide. I want to go back just for a second, if I could do this uh, quickly. Uh, yes, ta -da. I almost forgot the most important part of my slideshow. I almost forgot, do you believe it? My schedule, and uh, just to let people know that if they were interested in any of my tours, I work for a company called Strabo Tours. And um, if you want to uh, make a screenshot, you know, shift command number three, and then you would have my schedule and the uh, the website and the phone numbers down the bottom. You know, it's photo uh, www.phototc.com. I have uh, the uh, I'm blocking the the bottom of this with with all the the Zoom information, but there's a phone number back there, um, and also you can go to my website, which is Ron Rosenstock. 
Scottlandtalks.com and go to the tour page. You see, I have Scotland coming up and Italy, Morocco, and then next year, Morocco, Ireland, Faroe Islands, Vinyl Haven, Greenland, Scotland, and Morocco. So there's a lot going on. Uh, we're just beginning to plan 2025 when I'm going to slow down a little bit. Uh, I promised my wife that I'm not going to take off in the winter anymore. It's getting too hard to clean the driveway uh, with a snowblower and all that. So I'm going to hang around in winters. So I'm just going to do spring and fall from 20. Uh, 25 on and uh, you know the years keep flying by but I, uh, I'm going to go as long as I possibly can and I totally totally enjoy it so you know Strabo Tours is the company and um, they are the best they are really the best our accommodations transportation they're really excellent okay I'm going to go back to you Simeon fantastic Let me... so yes uh, so as Ron was saying you can actually go on any of his trips if you're interested and learn to do all that stuff yourself, it's uh, very easy. You just go to phototc.com and you'll see all of the available tours. You can reach out to Ron on his website, which is simply ronrosenstock.com. There's his uh, email. Feel free to reach out to him with your questions and your comments. So thank you uh, so very much to Ron Rosenstock. Thank you so much, Simeon. Really so appreciate it. Let's see what's coming up next week on Vienna Live. It is Melissa Missiner, Opera Tampa. Tampa Bay has a spectacular performing arts venue, the Straz Center, which will host Opera Tampa's three new productions this season, Don Giovanni, Hansel and Gretel, and La Traviata. As a community-focused opera company, Opera Tampa showcases local and international singers in casts that can't be heard anyplace else. Singer stage director Melissa Missner puts it all together and she's joining our show to take us on a VIP tour of Opera Tampa. That is, uh, as always, all information is available about upcoming shows at www.singingmore.com. Again, that is Melissa Missner, Opera Tampa. Once again, thank you so very much to Ro Ron Rosenstock. Thank you to Victoria and Frederick Mulligan, as well as Agnieszka and Benoit Rivolet for their support of this show. Most of all, thanks to you, our participants who make it all worthwhile. From New London, New Hampshire and Holden, Massachusetts, goodbye and see you next week. Bye, all.